People are different, no question about it, on their conservatism, their liberalism, we call that ideology, religious ideology, they've got very different opinions about things, want to take those opinions seriously. There's um, some pretty serious conflicts that arise from those differences. Moral evaluations even arise from those differences. The religious people are stupid, the atheists are cruel, whatever, I mean, it gets really personal in a hurry. I want to introduce to you a phrase, understanding-based empathy. Understanding-based empathy. The question that takes us to this phrase is, can you explain your ideological opponent deeply, accurately, sympathetically, so that your ideological opponent says, yes, you understand me. You've got me. You know what's most important to me. You know what I would go to bat for. You know what I would never compromise on. You can say it. I feel understood by you. Can we do that? The huge challenge is that to do that, you need to understand the other person. And I don't mean hand-holding pastoral understanding. I mean you actually need to understand their worldview. You need to understand their ideas and their convictions. Have you ever felt deeply understood, accurately understood, by an ideological opponent? Have you ever had that experience? I'd love to see. Have you ever felt so understood by an ideological opponent that you feel like you're humanly connected with them despite your disagreement? A few. Well, that is a tragically low number of hands, people. That's a very sad commentary on our world. I think. This understanding-based empathy is a pathway to this experience. It's an experience that you can give to other people and it's an experience that you can have for yourself. Understanding-based empathy can't be faked. You can't just want to be empathic based on understanding. Understanding-based empathy requires you to know the other person's ideas, why they think that way. It's easier to achieve than heart-to-heart -heart empathy. Heart-to-heart -heart empathy is complicated. It requires all kinds of psychological processing. It requires, I mean, heart-to-heart -heart empathy is the sort of thing you want with a spouse, for example or a dear, dear lifelong friend. You know them well enough for the gears of your differences to grind up against each other. Right? And anyone who's been married for more than five years knows what I'm talking about. The differences are precious, right? But they, they complicate life. They complicate life big time. And heart-to-heart -heart empathy, to understand the other person from their point of view, that is a life calling. It's a major operation. This is why we press understanding-based empathy as a technique for managing conflict because it's easier. It works with ideological enemies as well as with allies. My ideological partners, the people who agree with me, I might be able to understand them just by understanding myself. But the very same understanding-based empathy can be extended to enemies too, ideological enemies. It's realistic about deep differences between people. It doesn't require any homogenization doesn't require anyone to pretend that, well, you should think like I do. Nothing like that. It lets deep differences be differences. And it helps people feel closely bonded without having to agree. I've um, spoken with people where there are um, uh, very conservative and very liberal people in the audience. I've attempted to describe to each, each side of the room what the other side most cares about. The other side, the each side will say, yes, you've described us correctly. And the other side says, oh my goodness, I never knew that that's what was most important to you. I never knew. Why didn't I know that? They feel immediately bonded to each other after that. Just because they, they, can, they understand how each other ticks. It's so important. But it, they don't agree with each other. They don't leave the room with a changed political opinion. Not one single opinion changes but they feel more humanly connected. That's the secret of understanding-based empathy. You only need information and willingness. So what understanding matters? What kind of information helps? 
Conservatives and Liberals need one another. I'll explain more about that in a moment, but that's a key point. The way they need each other is important. Moderates can be an intentional and principled. They can see both sides of a conflict and they want to protect their ability to support the weak side so that the tension can be maintained and none of the wisdom lost. That is a very profound reason to be a moderate. And you can be a radical moderate with that viewpoint. There are plenty of moderates who are thoughtful, political and religious people who want to stay in the middle for a reason. Religious and political ideology is partially heritable. Did you know that? This is figured out using twin studies. And in this process, they discover that religious and political ideology go together. Conservatism, religiousness, and a fondness for hierarchy are all co-inherited at about the same rate as handedness. That's interesting. That means that there's a biological factor that predisposes us to be at one point or another on the ideological spectrum. Ideological preferences depend on temperament. They stabilize after about age 25. Why 25? You need a few years to get out of the family home, the family context, to be able to figure out where you're really at, and for your natural temperament to take over and make its proper full contribution to your ideological posture. Conservatism increases with age. As far as we know, this isn't a brain thing. We think this happens because as you live longer, you see enough about the world to discover that the thing those crazy liberals would be happy to get rid of, that terrible institution that's being unjust, that's hurting people, let's get rid of it. As you get older, you realize, dang, that thing was hard to build. And I've seen countries where they don't have that thing, you know, judicial system, whatever it is. And in those countries, it's even worse. We can't get rid of that thing. Reform it, yes, but we can't get rid of it. So enough experience causes people to value achieved complexity in social organization. That's why people tend to become more conservative with age. People can be religiously liberal and conservative in different ways. It's another big finding. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit of detail right now. But the general point to take home here is that we're not used to thinking about liberal and conservative as anything other than opposites. We're used to thinking of them on a line, liberal on the left, conservative on the right, and if you're not this, you're this, and if you're this, you're not that. But we've discovered that liberalism and conservatism in religion, and in politics by the way, but in religion, which is what I'm focusing on today, it's a multi-dimensional idea. Let me explain what I mean. Here's the first dimension of three. The first dimension in religious ideology has to do with belief. You can have, uh, you can have a left side meaning about purpose. The world is for enjoying and improving. And that's an essential part of salvation or liberation. Or you can have a right side meaning. The world is the stage in which salvation or liberation to a higher realm plays out. Both of those views are together in churches, in synagogues, in mosques. But one's leftish and one's rightish. With regard to reality, the left meaning tends to be natural. Ultimate reality is like or works through natural processes, where the rightish meaning is that ultimate reality is another realm of reality and it works into this, it reaches into this world to help. With regard to authority, left people tend to have dialogical understandings of authority. Whereas right people tend to have definitive understandings of authority, not negotiable, rooted in external sources. With regard to hermeneutics or interpretation, left meanings tend to be metaphorical, whereas right meanings tend to be literal. Now typically, most people line up, if they tend to be rightish, they tend to line up rightish on all of those things, or they tend to line up leftish on all of those things. But the thing is, there are exceptions. Our research shows that some people will flip on one or two of these. They might be generally rightish, for example, but when it comes to hermeneutics, maybe they have a literature degree or something, and they really care about metaphor, and they see power in metaphor and images, and they're not interested in literalism. They don't think that's true to the nature of the text or something. So they go leftwards on that issue. Now, the instruments that we build are sensitive enough to detect those kinds of differences. See, how, how different is that from a seven-point scale, from liberal to conservative and just say what you are? 
The second dimension is praxis. The leftish meaning of community, the community subdimension, is inclusive. You include people with different beliefs, within limits, not just anyone. The rightish meaning is that full membership requires agreement with identity defining beliefs. On ritual, the left meaning is diffuse. Rituals are used inconsistently and not for solving problems but for a kind of togetherness. Whereas they're focused on the rightish meaning, rituals are deployed in consistent ways to solve problems. If you're on the right, you know what ritual to deploy for what reason. You know how to do it. If you're on the left, you might be thinking up new rituals for today or, you know, let's just try this one. You wouldn't do that. That's not a rightish way of thinking about ritual. <clears throat> on faith, questing on the left, whereas following on the right. Social dynamics, the left meaning is radical. You advocate change as a creative quest for well-being, but on the right it's conventional. You resist social change because you want to express trust in the gyroscope that tradition is. The wisdom that's encoded in tradition should be preserved. It should be trusted. You can't just go reinventing the meaning of marriage. That's a very serious institution. You can't just go doing that according to the right, right? Social roles, egalitarian on the left, but hierarchical on the right. Once again, rightish people tend to line up and leftish people tend to line up on those five sub-dimensions, but there are lots of exceptions and subtleties. And finding ways to measure those subtleties has felt to us like a much more dignified way of connecting with people, of understanding the way people can feel about religion, about ideology, about being liberal or conservative. The third dimension is morality. And we didn't discover these five sub-dimensions. These came from work by Jonathan Haidt and Jesse Graham. Jesse Graham's one of our team members. Um, they discovered that there are f five dimensions of moral reasoning that are very deeply built inside us. And we find them just as important in religion as they are in politics. There's the harm-care dimension, which comes from fundamental attachments that we have to our loved ones, that's biologically rooted, and the virtues and ideals, kindness, gentleness, and nurturance. Then there's the fairness and reciprocity thing, which comes from the evolutionary story about reciprocal altruism. You build stronger groups by exchanging things with each other, right? But for that, you need justice, you need rights, you need autonomy. And then you've got in-group and loyalty. We're tribal creatures. We form shifting coalitions. We, we have limited resources. We need to be kind to the people who are inside our group and we need to monitor the group boundaries to avoid free riders from coming in and taking advantage of our resources and not contributing anything in return. So patriotism, self-sacrifice for the group, one for all and all for one, this togetherness thing. Authority and respect, hierarchical social interactions have turned out to be much more efficient than fully egalitarian ones. The most egalitarian civilizations, cultures, I mean, we've ever had were small-scale tribal cultures. Every time we've tried to put people together in larger numbers, <clears throat> beyond just a couple of thousand, egalitarianism doesn't work. Hi hierarchicalism is the thing that takes over. So deference to legitimate authority, respect for traditions. And then there's the purity-sanctity dimension, which comes from the psychology of disgust and contamination. Think of a piece of food with that green mold on it, like a piece of fruit that dropped on the, on the ground. It's fun to look at maybe, but if you thought about eating it, reach down to touch it, you probably wouldn't touch it, right? And if you got close to it and thought about putting it close to your mouth, what would happen to your face? You'd go, that disgust look, right? You'd get that disgust look. It's an inbuilt protection to help us avoid contaminants. People who don't have the disgust reaction, they get sick. They eat food they shouldn't. They don't survive. People who do survive much better. <clears throat> and as a spiritual, that, that whole biological thing is, uh, is extended into spirituality. The body is a temple that can be desecrated by immoral activities and contaminants. It's kind of metaphorical extension, but it really, it really entrains all of that disgust biological neurology. It gets it going. Right? All right. I've told you about 14 different sub-dimensions, liberal, conservative, 14 different ones clustered in three major dimensions, belief, praxis, and morality. This, we think, is the sort of cutting edge picture of ideology in religion. 
And people are not just neatly one thing or the other. They are all over the map. And when you chart people, or when you do the graphs of where people are, you see little off-diagonal clusters. You see, you see uh, people expressing themselves as they try to understand the world the best they can. Biologically conditioned in a certain way by their by their uh, the heritable aspects of ideology, but free to contest those things and to modify them and to use them to be the kind of person that they want to be. Bio-cultural. Bio-cultural. Both at once, always together. So now why do we need each other? Remember that was the first thing I listed on uh, the, the research promise, uh, the things that we've learned? Conservatives and liberals need each other. Conservatives understand how precious social forms are and how easy they are to lose. They do what it takes to protect society and keep it running efficiently. Liberals understand how precious individual lives are and how easily they can be harmed. They do what it takes to protect individuals and optimize well-being. Now, if you're like me and you're a computer geek, or a math geek, which is where I started my life in mathematics and sciences. What you see here is two optimization processes that are not in complete harmony with each other, possibly. The first one is trying to optimize energy. Energy is a scarce resource. It takes a lot of energy to maintain anything important or valuable. In order to protect energy, to use it wisely, you need to be smart about it. You have to optimize energy. That's the specialist contribution of the conservatives. But human lives can't be understood by averages. Human lives have to do with individual pains and joys and sorrows. They have to do with the infinitely intricate journeys that we all go on. How do you value that? If you just focus on institutional life, individual lives get chewed up all the time. And they get chewed up in such a way that you sort of don't even see it because the chewing up happens on the edges. And everyone who fits into the big group, well, they're doing fine. Where's the problem? The problem is on the edges, on the undersides of whatever civilizational order you've got. Liberals are the ones who empathically connect to the intricacy and beauty of every individual life. And they're the ones who will transform society, protest society, do what they have to, to honor the beauty and the glory of each individual person. Now, from my point of view, these two optimization processes are essential. You cannot have a civilization without them. You can't have any complicated social form without them. You need both. It can't all be about just caring for each other and feeling each other's pain and worrying about justice. And it can't all be about institutions, let's protect everything and forget the individual. Liberals and conservatives need each other. That we're built to be diverse ideologically because if we're not built that way, our civilizations will fall apart. Let's talk about conservative and liberal brains, personalities and churches. Why is gay marriage ordination, participation and leadership such a touchy issue? It's one of those hot button issues, isn't it? But why is it? Why are our conversations about this like that picture? I think the research on moral foundations theory really helps us understand not just that issue, but other hot button issues too. This graph is going to be really helpful. So let's talk about this. The questions that are asked in this research are how important are these various factors for you when you think about your moral life? How important are uh, the considerations having to do with harm <coughs> and care? How important are the considerations having to do with justice and fairness? And what about the in-group, out-group considerations? How important are they to you? All the hierarchy things, all the purity sanctity things. So when you find out how important they are to people and you know where they are on a spectrum, this is the graph you get. This is tens and tens of thousands of people producing this graph. Not a, I don't mean researchers, I mean data points. This is a really strong graph. Now what do you see? If you're on the far left, you're saying what's important to me is the harm and care dimension and the fairness and justice dimension. They matter to me, but those other things, the in-group, out-group monitoring, the hierarchy, the purity, sanctity thing, I've got real problems with those. And I say they're not important to me. I deliberately suppress them. I suppress the in-group, out-group thing because that leads to things like racism. 
xenophobia. I, I reject the hierarchy thing because that leads to things like sexism. I, I reject the purity sanctity thing because that leads to things like homophobia. So on the far left, people are suppressing those aspects and elevating the others. On the far right, everything's sort of together. All five factors are relevant on the conservative and extremely conservative side. The thought is that evolutionarily, we're all built with all five of these moral domains, and they all operate at about the same level, and that in small-scale societies, you need all five. So then, here's the question. How do we do church together? Is that a ridiculous ideal or is it an implacable obligation? I'm arguing that we need each other. We need each other because we're stronger together than we would be alone. Because each of us, each side, has wisdom. We need the wisdom to be combined. And we need a lot of people to understand both sides so that the wisdom can be fully present and vibrant in our communities. Doing church together is a real challenge. Understanding-based empathy really does help us walk alongside one another. At the level of small groups and congregations, we've seen understanding-based empathy make a huge difference. It doesn't change anyone's mind, but it keeps you doing church together despite the disagreements. So conflict and clergy stress, it's not just about personalities, that crazy person's giving me a hard time. It's not just about the church budget. It's not just about your meager salary and the stress that that induces in your family. It's about theologically loaded disagreements with real political and personal stakes. I've tried to describe some of them. It's intellectually confusing, it's emotionally exhausting, and it's spiritually disorienting. So, are you feeling intellectually confused? Then learn. Understand your ideological opponents and how they see their enemies. Maybe you're one of those enemies. Grasp why they're so passionate. Nurture empathy for them. Are you emotionally exhausted? Well, communicate. Test to see whether you really understand what each ideological camp most cares about. Do they recognize your version of their views? Can you be that person or not? There's a, it's amazing how emotionally exhausting it is to feel helpless. But when you communicate, that emotional helpless feeling can actually be mitigated fairly powerfully. You're doing something active. And finally, if you're sp feeling spiritually disoriented, I would like to say get real in the best sense of that phrase, the God who speaks from the whirlwind is not neatly scaled to human desires. Disorientation might be a sign of leaving old attachments behind. If you're feeling disoriented, it might be because the thing you were used to, which maybe wasn't that great, is starting to crumble. Spiritual disorientation can be a really good thing. It can take you into the next stage of a spiritual journey. Please share with me, talk to me about what's important to you as we go along, and I'm really looking forward to the contact. Thank you.